Hello, lovelies. Welcome to the Fat Joy Podcast, where we talk each week about how to flourish in an anti-fat world. I'm Sophia Apostle, a fat person and professional coach who loves talking to other fat people about what it's like to live within oppressive systems that marginalize our bodies and how we still dare to have the audacity and courage to reach towards our collective liberation and embrace our joy. Please know this is an adult content podcast, so there will be swears. We will be talking about harms we've experienced, and we will be rebelling against diet culture, anti-fatness, ableism, racism, etc. If you'd like to support the Fat Joy podcast, please check us out at patreon.com slash fatjoy. Oh, and I'm so glad you're here with us. Enjoy. Hello, lovelies. Welcome back to the Fat Joy podcast. I am here with Jen X, who I was introduced to by a dear friend of both of ours. And um, I'm so excited to talk to you, Jen. You are in areas that I don't know a lot about. So I'm so excited to learn from you. And um, when I did start checking you out, I was like, oh, Jen is like killing it on TikTok. She's doing so many neat, like so many neat aspects of the work that you do. So I'm just, I'm so thrilled to talk to you. We've just been chatting up a storm for like 15 minutes before we even start recording. And we're like, oh yeah, we should probably record some of this. So, so happy to have you. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here. It's such an honor. Yeah. Yay. Um, So Jen, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and all the things that you do? Absolutely. Yes. I am um, at this stage in my life, first and foremost, I do many things, but first and foremost, I'm a weight neutral body liberation oriented NIA fitness instructor and trainer. And I'm also a personal trainer. Yeah. Love that. Mm-hmm. And then you also do work with um, in the dementia community as well. Absolutely. Yes. I use um, those skills to help people um, develop relationships with movement within the NIA community. Excuse me, within the <laughs> dementia. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I'm excited to talk to you about that. As I was mentioning before we start recording, my mother-in-law is living with us and it's very interesting. The one aspect I anticipated many aspects of, you know, moving my mother-in-law in providing care, um, coordinating care for her, which is kind of my role. But what I didn't anticipate, and I'm excited to talk to you about this, was how it would bring up and challenge a lot of my own body acceptance, food acceptance, anti-diet approach, because that is not in her vocabulary or way of living. Even though she's 77 years old, she still has a lot of... uh, very diet focused behaviors and comments. And we have the kids like it's a, it's a whole thing that I, I really hadn't anticipated and we've had to really negotiate it over the last year. Um, so excited to talk to you about that too. <laughs> um, so interesting in that. Yeah. My own mother who's 75 years old and has last year been diagnosed with a life altering disease has lost a bunch of weight. And what that has brought up, no, not only for me, but, around reminding me of the childhood exposure to diet culture, right? Yes, right. Oh my gosh. Um, Before we go there, I want to start with my favorite question, which is telling us a little bit about your journey towards, with, around, (laughs) away from the word fat. How has this word played a role in your life? Oh my goodness. Uh, how, lo- how much time have you got? I know, right? 10 <laughs> hours. We have 10 <laughs> hours. <laughs> well, I mean, as, as is common for many of us, it, it all goes back to childhood and, and always being, whether I, I consider myself chubby or people were calling me fat or, f- you know, expletives using the mm-hmm. word fat. Um, I was always the, the kid who, stood out. I was a bit of a nerd. And um, not only could we not afford Jordash jeans, I don't know if you remember Jordash. I remember Jordash. Yes. Yeah. We couldn't afford them, but they didn't make them in my size. So 
that didn't matter. Um, yeah. So, and then, you know, fast forward to boyfriends, toxic energy around weight and discussion and preferences and so on. Um, eventually, um, I mean, I think you, I could probably look back and see that I had disordered eating patterns as a teenager, but it really came to a head in my early thirties. And, um, to make a very long story short, ended up with adult onset anorexia. Uh, and to cope with my anxiety, my raging emotions, um, I exercised a lot to the point it became an addiction. Mm. So yeah. that brought me to a very dark place, um, which uh, happily I'm, I'm, you know, 16 years in recovery now from, from that. Um, but it's, it's, con it's forced me to confront so many of my internalized biases and feelings and associations around the word fat, you know, and I've had so much therapy and so many, um, thankfully, um, positive influences that have helped me really reclaim that word to the point that I was so excited the other day. I was having a conversation with someone and they um, pointed at me and said, you know, I like fat people. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that was bold of them. <laughs> You, no, but you said, no, we're having a very, no, like a very social justice oriented conversation. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, so they know, they know the word fat. Yeah. They, and then, so there was this mutual understanding and I was like, he didn't flinch saying it. I didn't react. Wah, I'm here. Like, you know, it felt so good. Oh, I love um, that. You know, and just being able to talk about what do I do with my excess um, belly when I'm moving and sharing that with people? Like it's, it's just, it's so exciting to me to break the mold and just to reclaim the word. You know, I feel like there was a time in my life when you couldn't say the word black in reference to a color. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember whispering black um, and now we just say black and hopefully there'll be a day when we don't, you know, snicker about someone and just say, yeah, they're fat and she has blonde hair and he's in a wheelchair. Yeah. It just gets to be neutral. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I'm so curious when you mentioned um, beginning the recovery process, what supports did you have? You mentioned therapy. Was that kind of the main way that you were able to kind of challenge those beliefs that had you it with you know, with anorexia and exercise addiction. I'm really curious about that. Like, what were those first steps? Well, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, and you're familiar with the phrase, a teacher teaches what they need to learn. So I had taken this NIA training. Um, and in some disordered part of my brain thought, yes, I'm going to teach fitness and then I will be able to hang on to this disordered lifestyle. Um, so I found myself in front of a bunch of people saying, you know, that one of the main focuses of Nia is to embrace sensation, to be with what your body is feeling and then to adjust accordingly. So if, if you're doing something that's causing pain, let your wise body guide you to shifting that movement to create more pleasure. So uh, I can just imagine how contradictory that would be for you in the moment. Like I, I'm thinking back to my own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was listened to my body. Exactly. I was numb. I, a gentleman, I've forgotten his name who talks about us being brain taxis. I was a brain. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great term. I've not heard that. <laughs> yeah. and uh and so yeah so I was becoming more alive let's say air quotes like my body was waking up and um I was 
then, you know, I was saying, saying these things, you know, choose joy, choose pleasure, choose what's right for your body, do it your way. And um, I guess my subconscious was listening. So it was a big, that was a big part of reframing my relationship with my body to the point that, you know, I tell people when I started Nia, I gained weight and people are often like, oh, what? <laughs> um, but I, you know, I needed to, I, I needed to drop back into my body and treat it with kindness. And, and you know, the, there were a lot of things I was doing at the same time. Like that, that was one piece of it. Therapy, definitely, definitely, definitely challenged those old voices. Were you with an anti-diet therapist or was it a conventional therapist? Because if you're saying this is about 16-ish years ago, I hit the jackpot. I didn't know it. So um, the woman I was working with, I found through Sheena's place. I don't know if you're familiar. Yes. Yeah. In Toronto, it's the um, eating disorder uh, organization. Yeah. They offer programs, non-medical programs, programs based in the arts. Um, so I met, I think, I don't think I met her. I think we got a business card back in the day, right? From, and um, it just turned out she was a somatic based therapist um, and used to ask me where I would feel things in my body. And I'd be like, talking about and then you know <laughs> uh, but very like feminist anti-diet had done work in the in the field of eating disorder so I got so lucky oh, I'm so glad yeah that's that's a big score <laughs> from oh, back then well and back then there was no Facebook let me get this right yet yeah, no Facebook we you just had email you know, and a, a really rudimentary um, internet to to find resources. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'll also just say too, you know, so Sheena's place, um, uh, it is incredible. If if anyone um, you know is interested in their services, I'm sure they have virtual services nowadays. Uh, but they are so kind and gentle. Like I say, non medical. I always knew the medical model, which is punitive, was not going to work for me. Um, so, yeah, um, and support groups, I did a lot of support groups, a um, little bit of art therapy, um, meditation. It was, you know, I always say, it, I don't think it's like one, one thing. I think it's a, a, um, yeah. a collection of things that, that really helped me. Yeah. Yeah, that's so beautiful, this holistic approach that you were able to take. And I, again, my assumption is that this wasn't overnight. It was over a number of years. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and in there was a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So, you know, that, that um, in combination with with learning about other parts of myself, I mean, there was childhood issues I hadn't dealt with and and all kinds of things of course as you know it, it's never linear no no oh wow yeah oh beautiful that's and then now when it comes to the word fat I mean I was watching this morning a TikTok video of you like pulling up your shirt pulling down your pants and just grabbing your belly and it was just it was so truly joyful there was no shame there was just like this is my body I'm gonna share it and show it and nothing to be ashamed of and I got I mean again I see the world through this but I got a real like and fuck anyone who feels differently vibes and it's it's so powerful to see that what's it like for you now kind of and and this because when I look at your social there is a real social justice and advocacy type um, bet to it, right? That is, it feels purposeful in that way. So what's, what's it like to occupy that space now as a fat person in this space? Well, you know, it feels extremely liberating. And it's, um, you know, going from a place where, 
every minute of every day of every hour was consumed with food, thoughts of food and an exercise. Um, and now being able to, when I'm in a class and I feel the underarm skin moving and I feel my belly and my butt like shaking around, you know, when I'm trying to move my shoulders and all this other stuff. And I'm like, yes. Now, now I think about it like, there's there's two things I think I like to call um I think I'm clever maybe I'm not my my but my family assets <laughs> all the women all the women on my mom's side have this same round you know uh you know, but and yeah. I, I just <laughs> I love it and then but, you know, the more I learn about the body, every t every single time I'm shaking, I'm shaking loose toxins that are hanging in the tissues of my body. And thank goodness, thank goodness I can feel that. Thank goodness I have the privilege of of uh, working with my body in a way that, you, you know, fe not only feels good, but at a cellular level um, is, is helping. So, it, you know, and previously it'd be like, oh my God, I can think even three years ago, back fat shaking. Mm -hmm. I I was like horrified. Now, present day, yeah, I, I don't care what anyone thinks. No. Yeah, I'm a human maraca. I'm just gonna like shake everything. I love that. And that's such, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. so that's something that Nia has taught me um, and perhaps I've um, amplified is that it's more important to feel good than to look good. Oh. Right? Like I deserve that. It's my birthright to feel good. Mm -hmm. And why why should I um do some kind of movement or some kind of, you know, eating program that doesn't make me feel good? That's just taking the life force out of me. Right? It's like, but it's it's so interesting again, like even just the ethos of that with Nia um is so countercultural to you must suffer to look good or no pain no gain or you know all of these things that have been created by capitalism to have us just you know feel like if we're not harming ourselves in some way then we're not doing it right and like i i mean i spent my whole life believing that I and it's very interesting how those beliefs are not only just part of our society but how they get passed down from our family like my parents are very much the if you're not like stressed out if you're not suffering they wouldn't say it this way but like you've got to work hard you know they they're immigrants they worked hard they suffered it was a hard life and like that's the accomplishment that it was a hard life that means something that means it was worth it and I'm like and so they don't understand me when I'm like but I don't want to suffer like what why is suffering the goal and that's just been given to us through oppression right so even the fact that Nia is like no if your body is not feeling good in this moment don't do it <laughs> that's hugely counter it, it totally is. And like, you know, Nia is going on 40 years old. And I think back when they uh, were developing it was a time when jump aerobics was big. Yes. The no pain. You said it, the no pain, no gain. Where people were like, speaking of capitalism, um, coming up with more rubber on the soles of shoes. You had to buy these shoes um, to protect your joints. Whereas the founders of Mia took off their shoes. We do it barefoot. Oh, yeah, so yeah. In many ways, it's not like you have to have certain clothes or certain shoes. Or you just have to have a body. Right. And you work with your body as opposed to, let me put more rubber so that I can really work my knee joints even harder and possibly damage them even more. But it's okay if I look a certain way. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Oh, and I, so every time I think about it, I'm like, and I spent decades living that way. Listen, 30 plus years. Yes. <laughs> Um, we've been using this word Nia, but can you tell just like what what is Nia? Because I actually hadn't heard of it before. I've heard of 
I think I've heard it just briefly, but I actually don't know a whole lot about what it is and and what a class looks like. Sure, sure. So um, Nia, as as I said, was born out of this um, this sort of desire to uh, s- stop injuring bodies. Um, the people who founded it were in the the aerobics industry and just noticing like knee pain, knee damage, ankle, hips. Um, and so thought there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a more joyful way to move. So they stepped away from that traditional um, fitness practice and did a lot of research about what are movement forms that already exist that treat the body with respect and kindness and are based on um, using the body in the way it was designed to be built, to be used. So instead of forcing the body to do something, it's not, it, the body was never intended to put thousands of pounds of pressure by jumping up and right? Um, so essentially, um, Nia embraces nine different movement forms. So we've got dance arts, we've got martial arts, we've got healing arts. So element, oh. elements of things like jazz, modern dance, Tai Chi, Aikwondo, Taekwondo, um, Aikido, we've got like yoga and various other healing um, modalities that are kind of blended together. And a class looks like um, we're standing for, unless I, I mean, I offer, I do both standing and seated classes, um, but it's generally considered to be a cardiovascular aerobic conditioning, um, just not in jumping up and down ways. So originally Nia stood for non-impact aerobics. Oh, that's where that comes from. Cool. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And then over time, um, you know, it's more, it's become more than that. So we've, we've moved away from it being an acronym to a proper noun now. So it's just Nia, like yoga. Yeah. yeah. Um, so essentially we start out, out with a warm up. We, um, get, get our heart rate up, get moving, um, cool down, come down to the floor or maybe stay in the chair. Um, at the end, and I'm pointing behind me. This is my home studio. It's beautiful. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so it's, I mean, that's a snapshot of kind of what it would look like. And people will say, to look at it, it might not look like a lot. Um, but I, for example, I have a client who, uh, told her physiotherapist um, about the fact that she's been coming to Nia for years and the physio decided to take a class last week. And she was like, boy. <laughs> you know, like, and so if you want it to be an, a more athletic workout, you want to move more energy. If that's your body's way, you can do it. that way. Nice. Um, you can go like sink lower, reach up higher, or you can keep it quite gentle, which mm. is, you know, what, um, what a lot of my clients tend to, that's where their energy is. Um, and it's, like I said, it's adaptable. So I do it in the chair. Um, sometimes I do it part time, part in the chair, part standing, depending on who the audience is. Um, so it's really got a lot of appeal, I think, to, to different groups of people. Oh yeah. Well, and that sounds so fun. Those three different, um, uh, t- movement types that you incorporate together. That actually sounds like so much fun. And I love the adaptability of it too, because there are some days where I might have more energy and other days where I might just want my body is wanting to go more gently. So that's beautiful that there's that flexibility because that's not always, well, in my experience, that's not often the case in, you know, even if you think about something like Zumba or different yogas, like you're, there's, there's a structure that is meant to be followed at a certain intensity. Um, so you really stand out if you shift and aren't at that intensity. Um, whereas this sounds like that's actually built in the flexibility and adaptability is really built into it, which is, which is lovely because there are just some things my body like that can't do as easily. And I, 
oh, I struggle to find modalities that can have adaptability and flexibility, which is true for a lot of fat people and people with disabilities, disabled people. Like there is, there's a need for that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the fact that, you know, it's, it is a practice um, to move away from the thinking, I should be doing this, I should, you know, I should look like the teacher to like reclaiming, no, my body right now says, take a break, have some water, make the movement smaller, whatever it is. Yeah. Mm hmm. And what I so appreciate, uh, what, what also helped me reframe was we don't, it's not Nia exercise, it's Nia movement. movement. Yeah. Movement, right? And the, the, the side effect is all those things that are good for our bodies. But first and foremost, it's about movement and learning about the relationship of t your body and your relationship to movement. So that even through, like, I'm moving my hand right now, this is a relationship with the movement of my hand, you know, and it becomes really poetic and beautiful. Oh, oh I love that. Oh, I'm going to sign up for a class because I think you're doing Zoom, right? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. am. That sounds so lovely. I'd love to experience that. Um. I'm also really curious because you also mentioned your personal trainer and you're also doing quite a lot of, again, like tying, I'm so curious about how you tie together the NIA work, your anti-oppression, social justice work, your personal training, like how, because I'm noticing with the more conversations I have, people are finding ways to bring together into their businesses, into their practices, an anti-oppression, social justice lens. And that's very, very exciting. Um, how are you, how are you doing it? How is that showing up for you in your work? Well, one very big way that that's showing up is um, I am a NIA trainer, which means I I can train people to become NIA teachers. Um, and so my NIA colleague and I um, are running a, a training right now. And we've put um, the material, which really lends itself so beautifully to social justice. We've um, sort of put that through a social justice lens. And we look at um, concepts that um, ooh, uh, concepts that come through the embodied social justice community um, of uh, feeling um, safety, dignity, and belonging. And we put those concepts against um, some of the concepts that are are in the our NIA training material, and then also, you know, that's sort of a one concrete way. Um, another way is really bringing um, diversity in music. Mm, yes, a diversity in music to um, what what's what I'm sharing. Um, so looking at you know, I've had a lot of, I've reflected a lot on what does my music library look like? What are my go-to, mm -hmm. um, you know, pieces or artists and really integrating more um, diverse people who really use music as as their voice to, to um, promote change in the world. Yeah. So that opens up so many possibilities. Um, and uh, just the exposure is is incredible. And then things like um, back in 2020, um, I, it, this is just sort of a metric for how much growth I have done since 2020. In early 2020, I had um, debuted, I had put together a routine using Lizzo's music. Mm -hmm. And I remember being terrified because here I am teaching it to a class of white middle-aged privileged women right mm -hmm. uh, but she had she had and has and continues to just be so Ugh. apologetically herself and it's just like such a breath of fresh air that I had to do it but you know prior to teaching that very the very first time 
I don't think I've ever been as nervous to teach. I was so um, in my head worried about but Lizzo swears and she uses AAVE and mm -hmm. um, what are these people going to think? And, and I brought, someone asked me to, to reteach it last week. So I brought it back out um, and added some of her, her, new, her new amazing music. Uh, and this time I was like, this is the way she speaks. She's a, she's a role model for change and for liberation from um, judgment and mm -hmm. criticism and um, let's do the class. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, I was just like, mm, this is, when I saw you doing a whole Lizzo week, like Lizzo, and I was like, mm, so I, mean, I saw Lizzo last week in Toronto. Oh. It was unreal. She is, oh. she is everything. Oh, uh, wow. Well, I, I, a friend asked me to go and I just, I, you know, I'm just, I'm immunocompromised. I'm we're thinking about my mom and all that, so it's complicated. But I'm so glad you got to go. Yeah, it was, and it was such again. And she spoke to this. She, you know, she said, "Look, I'm a black woman making music from a black perspective." Because there's because people are there's a lot of people who are very anti Lizzo because of what she represents. She's a fat black woman. She's popular. You know, Kanye's saying shit about her but you know, whatever i'm not gonna talk about him oh but like and she was just so clear in her concert talking to the audience about look this is who i am this is how i do things and i'm not gonna apologize she is truly unapologetic and she is in her body she wore you know, like her classic body suits and her big girls were dancing and shaking and you could just see everything. And it was incredible to be in that space. And I will say it was incredible to be in an audience that was so diverse, so many fat bodies in that space. I was like in heaven. I'm like, this because you don't, you, there's not a lot of spaces where a lot of fat people feel safe feel like they'll have dignity i'm going to take your words and feel like they belong and lizzo has people feel safe feel filled with dignity and feel like they belong and those people showed up and i was just in awe with everything about the experience it was really transcendent I want to get instagram handles of everyone there like oh know? my god can i just follow everybody all twenty thousand of you let's just be friends yeah it was amazing it was amazing oh i'm so yeah. glad so i love that's so fun that you're like having a lizzo week and you're bringing it in and and that's a beautiful ripple effect too because like you said you're you are mostly in front of white middle-aged women of privilege and so like exposing them having them open and get curious um that's really powerful too that that is advocacy work 100 percent. yeah and it's um it's me standing in my power too and also saying you know i matter and this is what feeds me so i'm sharing this with you yeah and getting over my stories about oh they hate me and you know, yeah 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 j just things like that so yeah it's a constant learning totally and uh, you know i'm constantly reading and listening to webinars and podcasts and thankfully people like you who are putting their genius out there <laughs> um because that all has uh, you know ripples of um influence and um yeah it just it's reshape like literally i get get a little geeky about like neurology yeah well who have neurological issues and i'm just like i'm like i'm changing my neurology here i'm different synapses are firing yeah so. yeah i have a neuroscience neuroscience coaching background too so i love yeah the neuroplasticity of the brain that we can the more we do things the more we are building those pathways and that's just i just think that's amazing when we know that we can do that and just by like a little choice every day or every other day or whatever it is it doesn't even take that much our brain wants to learn and grow it loves it it keeps it alive definitely and you know i intentionally too um surrounded myself as 
you know, online as much as is possible, which is a little easier um, with a diverse group of people. I want to know what's happening in the disability community, in the mental health community, in the, you know, I want to learn from young people. I follow young people. Um, it, I, I just, I want to be exposed to it all and not become insular and, um, yeah, so that's important to me. So true. I saw a really good meme the other day that was, it said something like, if you're over 35, you need a mentor who is under 35 and I was like oh I'm 42 I think that's me <laughs> I just love that because I thought that's so true that's so true so true and I um I yes I saw that just this morning that's so yeah <laughs> possibly on your page I don't know oh I think I, I think I shared it I don't even remember anyway the algorithm's listening always it probably knew we were talking because it's in our calendars you know <laughs> Well, no, it's true. I mean, I have, uh, for my other field, I have a mentor and it's quite mentee, pardon me, but she's my mentor too. Like who, who 20, 23 year old woman. Um, yeah. So I think it's really, it's really important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd love to talk a little bit about, um, the dementia community work that you do, the, and, and kind of, I guess the more generalized topic is something that I've experienced myself that I am experienced that you as well you're a part-time caregiver for your mother there's this thing that's happening and I guess I'm becoming really aware of it because I'm now in my 40s my partner's in his late 40s we're caring for his mother and I'm noticing there's an increasing number of my friends who are in these positions of starting to be caregivers for their parents and what's what I mentioned at the beginning, we start talking what's unexpected and what's happening that's bringing up a lot for people is it's kind of like it's resurf it, it's not kind of like it is resurfacing um diet culture related wounding from childhood because while I may have shifted my beliefs, my elder family members, and in this case you know, specifically my mother-in-law have not. And it's really, really hard because it's like, oh, I thought I dealt with all this shit. I'm in a great place. Oh, oh gosh. Now it's this other person. And, and especially when they're older, like my mother-in-law does have um, dementia. And so it's not like we can have conversations that will adjust her thinking in any way. So it becomes almost, I feel like, I'm defending against, which is not how I want to feel. So it's very complicated. Um, and I'm just so curious, like in the work that you do with people with dementia, probably, I imagine you're connecting with their families as well. Like what, I, I don't know. I don't even know what the question is, but I'm just noticing there's something really complicated there around diet culture, around healthism. I'm sure there's stuff with ageism. I'm making all kinds of assumptions about her. Like, it's messy. It's messy. It's messy, Jen. How, I don't know, find a thread. How can, help us, help me. <laughs> well, I do a lot of online work, but I am also connected to a community um, where we meet in person. And um, it is so interesting. And, and I've been doing this um, with this particular group um, for, let's, I think it's maybe seven years now. And they're, sometimes is um like a well there's two there's like just the conditioning and then there's the lack of filter right so what you think is what you say and so that can be um fairly harmful because it reveals some of those um inherent biases um but you know there are i mean i don't have um I, I don't know that I have wise, wise words, but um, there are ways of, like I notice sometimes people will talk about my body and I, I will just say, I don't talk about my body. That's kind of off. Mm. Um, so it goes back to, I think, boundaries. Um, 
and also sort of an adjustment on my end in that I would like to think that I have magical powers and I can change everyone. That is not, turns out that's not true. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, if we think about it from the, the point of view of mentorship, uh, sometimes I feel like, okay, I'm being a mentor. I'm influ- influencing them. Maybe not even at a, at a conscious level, but at a s- subconscious level, like, my my choices of words, my demonstration of how um, I'm I I celebrate I appreciate my body. Um, for example, also I mean not with the dementia community, but pointing out Lizzo celebrates. She talks about her her butt getting thicker and thicker, and I was like, ah, who who does that? That's so great. You know, pointing out those lyrics or um, and just. Another big thing I, I've learned, um, so I'm part of a group called Reimagining Dementia, which is an international group of um, scientists and caregivers and people living with dementia who um, really want to reframe the the tragedy narrative. Yes. Oh. Um, and instead focus on what is possible. Um, and versus what is impossible um and it's this group of people um we we play with that concept through the arts so for example through improv and in talking to a person this is this is interesting when talking to a person with dementia staying with i'm sure you have this experience staying with where they are and treating it like um sort of a a a creative activity so who's that man at the door you know you could say there's no man at the door or you could say oh he's that friendly neighbor but he's going to come back later we'll you know move on to to something else and and just sort of being in relationship in a different way oh i love that following their thread um so i mean it's so multifaceted right yeah Am I going to change my mom's opinion about dieting and her weight and her? I don't think so. Um, but I can be a positive influence. Mm. Oh, I love it. both of those things are actually really helpful. I'm totally being selfish, but the thinking about my interactions with my mother in law me in a mentoring role as opposed to a defensive role which is what I have been doing and then also I love the idea of improv she has she's um and I imagine again I think this is it's so interesting I I, you know I know every every case is different but her I imagine this is true for a lot of people who are caring for parents or interacting with older parents where her speech abilities are have changed so dramatically in the last five years and so have treating it almost as an improv conversation that actually suddenly makes it feel like i want to talk to her more you know so i feel like you've just given me two mindset shifts that i i imagine are also going to be really helpful for people listening because i find i'm mostly defensive i'm mostly trying to protect the kids from stuff that she might say you know we had her sister over sometime last year and there was all sorts of comments and she's in she's like 72 and my mother-in-law 77 and all the comments were about like earning the barbecue that we were about to have and like all the and and I just I was so I quite frankly I was really shocked and I don't I don't know why I just I just was so shocked I didn't even know what to say in the moment and then I talked with my partner about it after and We agreed, you know, if anything like that comes up again, we're going to like pull her aside and say, look, in this house, like we really, we don't want to focus on food in that way. There's no good and bad. You don't have to earn anything. And we're modeling this for the kids. So please don't say stuff like that. So we'll, we'll approach it differently. But I think in the moment, we were both just so surprised to, to, and again, I think I had an assumption about someone in their seventies, like, why would they care about that stuff? But of course they would, because they have spent. 72 years being, you know, swimming in the diet culture waters. But again, until I had a lot of close contact with people in their 70s and 80s, I I didn't know 
that that was still a thing. Yeah, I know. I know. It's it's it seems somehow shocking to prioritize what you look like over your health. Just have been my experience. Um, but um, the other thing I was going to say was, and it's going to come back to me. Oh, um, so what I have also learned, um, you know, it's kind of I, I've had to look at my own um, ageism and what. <laughs> And dementiaism, I don't know. Um, but there, while you might not be able to change someone, I think if we go in with the mindset, which is what we do at the program I work at, we go in with the mindset that anyone can learn. Mm -hmm. Anyone can, they can learn a small thing about themselves. They can learn. And even if it, if, if it's not a, a verbal IQ learning, Maybe it's a, it's a body learning. So, um, and maybe that's, um, that's a way to approach it as well. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's so generous. It's so generous. And I, I want to feel that way in my interactions with not only my mother in law, but other people I interact with. Well, and listen, we all have a history. The closer people are, I find for me, the more difficult it is. Oh, yeah. Someone else's mother. It's yeah. so much easier to do. <laughs> it's true. Someone else's mother-in-law. Yeah, it's so much easier. So there's all the personal stuff wrapped up in it as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. I mean, you're making me think about how our interactions with older folks gets to be kind of another mirror through which we get to continue our own learning and yeah, deepening our commitment, or I'll say for myself, deepening my commitment to anti-oppression work and examining, I haven't really examined my own ageism. And I'm realizing in this moment, that's actually something I, I need to spend some time with, because I definitely make a lot of assumptions about what's possible for her. And then I base care decisions on that. And I think, yeah, there's, that's an area for me to do some work on. So thank you for being a mirror for me in that I hadn't really thought about that before now no it, you know it's it's something that I challenge myself with all the time too it's it's like oh you know some of the people I were of oh, they can't and then they surprise me yeah like that's my implicit bi bias like I am I'm holding on to these stories instead of just seeing a person as a person of possibility instead it, you know I went to school for speech language pathology where we label everyone, mm -hmm. right? And that how dangerous is that to to put rules on people? Because then you put them in boxes and there's you don't allow for those possibilities. Yeah, so true. Oh, beautiful. Um, Jen, I wanna connect with you about joy now. <laughs> how do you stay connected to joy? I mean, you how do you um, acknowledge, honor, are present with the harms that exist in this world, both for you and for others, and yet also hold space and make room and choose to turn towards joy. How do you manage that balance and what do you do? It's so interesting that you, you use the word choose, choose to move towards joy, um, because the way I understand it and the way sort of Nia approaches it. Inter interestingly, we have in each um, training, we have principles. And the number one principle of the very first um, training is the joy of movement. It's about choosing joy. Um, and, you know, I it's it's a practice for me certainly in that i mentioned i have bipolar disorder so i tend to go more towards the depressive side um and so i feel like there's this this idea that that joy is all around me joy is um like in the beautiful way the sun is reflecting on my mirror. Joy is um, in the way I can move my wrist. It's it's kind of an energy. Joy is um, even the little tiny spider that I see crawl, crawling across my basement floor here. Um, 
that that is kind of an energy that's that's just related to life and that I can access at any time. So is it more difficult when I'm depressed? Yes. Um, and I can choose the joy of when I'm depressed. One of the things I really want to do is sleep. The joy of being able to sleep, right? The joy of taking care of my body and my brain. Um, so it's not in the joy of, you know, this depression makes me feel a lot like it does make me feel alive. It's a certain aliveness. Oh, it's yeah. Not, it's not a I'm pointing here to to my core almost like my yeah. shock, you know, um, that it's it's sort of omnipresent. It's it's always there and it it allows me to be in relationship with the sadness. Like I don't have to run away from it. I can be with it and let it um, run its course and do things like choosing to do things that make me feel better. If that's sleeping all day, that's what it is. Yeah. Oh, and finding the joy in that. That's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Instead of, you know, I would have previously, it's interesting, um, uh, I've, I've done programs on joy with people with dementia. So um, when you do a mainstream Google search on joy, did you know that you probably know that what comes up a lot are religious concept yeah and and yes you know i grew up attending the salvation army church and so that's what it's like i've got the joy 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 i don't know if you <laughs> it was like associated with god or with you know, as opposed to being something within me something within everything around me um that is always there always accessible yeah yeah, even in a small way. Like I love how you said there's even joy in the spider crawling across my floor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's their joy, beauty. I mean, they're not synonymous, but there's this kind of, oh, this is a living being. This is a, there is a connection. I mean, it's deeper, you know, just like happy, happy, joy, joy. Right, right. Um, there's a joy in like, moving my body in very small ways in in just being connected to it in um yeah in in any moment with any emotion it it can be within the context of joy which is for me huge in that i'm used to going oh i'm feeling sad let me distract myself over here doing something else as opposed to just staying with it um, and letting it move through my body yeah absolutely yeah it makes me think about the the smallest way the smallest step that we can choose towards joy and for me that is coming back to my breath no matter what's going on the one constant is that i will always have breath coming in and out and if i can remind myself to piggyback onto the movement of that breath of feeling it move through me and the miracle that that is that is often my my gateway into a connection to joy when i'm feeling very distant from it um do you have a version of that do you have like a really tiny thing that you do yeah that's a that's a good question do i have a go-to well i often um again use sensation like noticing where when i feel disconnected noticing where my body is touching either itself or something else around me like how what is the pressure feel of my feet on the floor my hips on this stool i'm sitting on my arms you know connected to my thighs um how does, or how is the bed even, you know, I'm depressed and sleeping, but I don't, I, you know, I don't want to totally leave my body. How, where is my body touching the bed? Mm, yeah. That's a beautiful, yeah. Tuning to the sensations of the body. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. 
Thank you, Jen. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I feel like I learned so much. I've made notes for myself of things for to keep keep thinking about and percolate on and do some work on that. And um, I so appreciate you and this conversation. And I appreciate you and your work, all you bring to to your community and to this world. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go, I'd like to read a poem because poetry can reach our hearts in a different way. Poems can have us feel in a different way. And that's what this podcast is about, expanding our hearts, deepening our empathy, and inviting in joy. So each week you get a new poem. I love how this poem, The Peace of Wild Things, written by Wendell Berry, takes me back to the essentials, to what really matters, to grace and rest and freedom. And I felt so connected to these essentials during my conversation with Jen Hicks. She has a way of bringing us back, coming home to ourselves that I found deeply resonant. So here's the poem. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Thank you for joining me today. My hope is that you're feeling a little less alone and a little more seen. So until the next episode, you can find me on Instagram at fatjoy.life, on the website at www.fatjoy.life and on Patreon at patreon.com slash fatjoy. Please don't forget to check out the show notes for how you can connect with my amazing guest and for the links to the poem. All right, lovely. I am sending you off with my wishes for an abundantly fat joy day. Talk again soon.